Okay, in this video we will discuss the total probability theorem and Bayes' rule, which are two calculations that utilize uh, uh, set theory and conditional probabilities in some convenient ways for a number of types of calculations. So let's talk about the total probability theorem first, or, or the theorem of total probability. So in order to utilize this we need two sets of events. So first we're going to have an event A, that's the one that we're interested in, and then we're going to have a set of mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive events E1 through EN. And so remember, mutually exclusive means that there are no outcomes uh, in common with any of these events. So, so any outcome will be in uh, only one of these events. Uh, it won't be in uh, two or more. And then collectively exhaustive means that any possible outcome is in one of these events. So no matter what outcome in the sample space, it's going to be in exactly one of these events, E1 through EN. So the total probability theorem is just a way of manipulating those uh, conditional probabilities we talked about in the other video. And it says the probability of A, this event we're interested in, is the sum from uh, one, I equals 1 to N of the probability of A conditioned on the event EI times the probability of the event EI. Right, so the, this uh, kernel inside of this summation, uh, we're recalling our definition of conditional probabilities, that's the probability of A intersected with EI. And then we're going to sum those all up over all the different values of I. And graphically, that's what, what's going on is shown down here. So the rectangle is our sample space. This kind of blob in the middle is the event A that we're interested in. And then E1, E2, up through EN are mutually exclusive, which means there's no kind of overlapped intersecting um, spaces in these events, and they're collectively exhaustive, which means they span that whole sample space. And so these terms in the summations, so we can say, okay, for I equals 1, the probability of event E1 is the probability that some outcome is in this rectangle region here. And then the probability of A given event E1 will be that given that we're in this shaded region here, what's the probability that we fall inside of A? Right? And so the product of those two is going to be, uh, or, or, or sorry, the, the intersection, you know, the product, product of those two probabilities is the probability of the intersection of E1 with A, this shaded region here. Okay? So we found for I equals 1, the probability of being in this shaded region, or this hatched region, and then we're going to take and do the same thing for uh, i equals 2, and we'll find the probability of being in this uh, outlined region here, the probability of E2 intersected with A, and we'll move along through all the different events, uh, and when we add up all those probabilities, we're going to get the probability of A itself. Okay, so let's do a, a quick calculation using this theorem of total probability to illustrate what's going on. So you can read along some of these words here, or you can pause the video to uh, take a look at more carefully if I'm going too fast. Um, so we're going to be interested in the probability that building X collapses. So building X collapsing, that's going to be kind of our event A from the, uh, um, the previous slide, or I'm not going to call it um, C for collapse, just to kind of keep uh, things uh, uh, a little bit mnemonically labeled here. And then uh, that's going to, that probability of that collapse is going to be conditioned on how big of an earthquake we had. Um, and so we've got three different types of earthquakes here. We've got a strong earthquake, a medium earthquake, and a weak earthquake. So those are our um, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive uh, events. So just from their verbal descriptions, we can see that uh, they kind of describe uh, separate types of events. And when we add up the probabilities, we see they sum to one. So that means that they are uh, kind of spanning the sample space. So these are like the E1, uh, E2, E3 from the previous slides formula. And then we've got from uh, structural analysis results, we can find the probability of collapse given a strong earthquake, given a medium earthquake, and given a weak earthquake. So these are like our probability of the A given EI terms from the previous slide. And so we want to know the probability of that building X collapses. Um, so I can say the, um, the probability of the building collapsing is going to be the sum i equals 1 to 3. I've got three conditioning events here of the probability of collapse given EI, the strong, medium, weak. I'm just going to kind of switch back and forth notation here a little bit. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Times the probability of EI. Right, so I'll have the probability of collapse given a strong earthquake, the 0.9, times the probability of the strong earthquake, 0 0.01. Uh, and so on. We'll add those up, and then uh, I've got the answer written down for you already. You can look through the math yourself to uh, convince yourself. 
Okay, so the interesting thing here, uh, and, and hopefully this starts to point out why this total probability theorem is a valuable tool, is that we can take a um, complicated problem like the collapse of a building, and we can deconstruct it into some separate steps. So I can say, well, first let me model how strong the earthquake would be, and then conditioned on how strong the earthquake is, let me predict collapse. So that lets me, lets me break apart the problem into two separate uh, issues um, that I can study separately, and then this lets me do the bookkeeping to put things back together. That's not only convenient in that it lets me um, kind of break the problem apart into you know, sub-problems, but it also lets me um, delegate different parts of this problem to different specialists, which becomes important when looking at really complex problems. So in this case, you can imagine that seismologists could work on the problem of, of how strong an earthquake would be in the future, and that uh, an engineer could work on the problem of what's the likelihood that a building would collapse given the, an earthquake of a given size. And then the, the analysis done by two separate people or two separate groups of people could be then be combined in a um, correct manner in order to make inferences about some event that may or may not happen in the future. And so those are both the kind of practicality of, of breaking apart the problem and the ability to um, let different experts solve different parts of the problem are, are two ways in which this total probability theorem really helps us um, to manage computing probabilities of, of events associated with complicated uh, phenomena. Okay, then a partner calculation that often comes along with the total probability theorem is, is Bayes' rule. And again, this is just a manipulation of conditional probabilities in a way that's, that's really convenient for us. Um, we're going to think about the same uh, situations. We've got the event A, just like we did with the total probability theorem, and then the collection of mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive events, E1 to EN, just as before a few slides ago. And we can think about uh, some conditional probability manipulations. So from the uh, conditional probability definitions, we saw that the event, the probability of the intersection of two events can be found as the probability of one of those events times the probability of the second event conditioned on the first event. Right? And, and so I can say the probability of A given, uh, sorry, probability of A times the probability of EJ given A. That product of probabilities would give me the, pro the probability of the intersection of A and EJ. Or I could flip things around and say, well, the probability of EJ times the probability of A given EJ also gives me the same probability of that intersection. So if we take the last two terms out of this set of three uh, equalities, and we just divide both sides by the probability of A, then I've got the probability of EJ given A left on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, the probability of A given EJ times the probability of EJ divided by the probability of A. Okay? And what's helpful here is that we've taken and we've reversed the order of conditioning of, of two events. All right, so if, um, if I want to know the probability of EJ given A, and I only know the probability of A given EJ, I can, I can reverse the order of conditioning by multiplying and dividing by these appropriate probabilities on the right-hand side. And that's the, uh, the useful thing of, uh, associated with Bayes' rule. Okay, and then the other thing we can do is note that, well, probability of A, that was a probability that we computed it a couple slides ago using the total probability theorem with the same setup. So we could just substitute in that formula from two slides ago into the denominator for the probability of A. And now on the right-hand side, all I have is probabilities of these mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive events, the E's, and then conditional probabilities of A given those E's. All right, so I, um, I can kind of compute A right along with it. And, and this denominator term using the total probability theorem is one of the reasons why Bayes' rule often shows up with the total probability theorem, because it's um, a very useful calculation for finding this denominator term. Okay, so we can do a quick example calculation with Bayes' rule as well. We'll consider the same problem as a couple slides ago. So I just repeated the probabilities of the strong, medium, and weak earthquakes, and the probability of collapse conditional on those earthquakes um, here for reference. And then now the question is, let's say we're out of town and we get a call that there was an earthquake and the building collapsed, but we don't know yet whether it was a strong medium or a weak earthquake. We could ask what it was the probability that it was a strong earthquake given that we know that the, earth, uh, the building collapsed. All right, so the question we're interested in is what's the probability of a strong earthquake given that the building collapsed? And so I don't know that, but I see that I've got the, the probabilities with the reverse conditioning here. So I can say, well, I know the probability of collapse given a strong earthquake and then I'll use Bayes' rule to uh, reverse that order of conditioning. So I want the probability of a strong earthquake in the numerator, so that now in the numerator I've got the probability of collapse and a strong earthquake. 
And on the right-hand side, I would have conditioned by the probability of collapse, but that's now down in the denominator here. Probability of collapse in the denominator. Oh, well, let's just quickly plug in the numbers here. Collapse given a strong earthquake, 0.9. Probability of a strong earthquake, 0 0.01. And then the probability of collapse we've learned in the previous uh, two slides ago from the total probability theorem, 0 0.0379. And we get 0 0.24 as our probability of a strong earthquake given collapse. Just for reference, you can do this at uh, home. The probability of a medium earthquake given collapse is 0 0.53. And the probability of a weak earthquake given collapse is 0 0.24 as well. And so an interesting thing to note here is that the, the most likely outcome given a collapse of an earthquake is that we had a medium earthquake. Um, and that may be a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, I think most people tend to look at these conditional probabilities and place a little bit of extra emphasis there. And they see that, well, it's, it's so likely that I would have a collapse given a strong earthquake. And it's not that likely that I would have collapse given a medium earthquake. So probably I had a strong earthquake if the building collapsed. But what this Bayes rule calculation is doing is also weighting the kind of prior probabilities of the strong, medium, and weak earthquakes. That's the second term in the numerator. And we see that the strong earthquake is only a tenth as likely as the medium earthquake to occur. So even though the building is much more likely to collapse, that doesn't make up for the fact that these strong earthquakes are very rare. And so if all I know is that an earthquake happened, it's, you know, it's much more likely that a, that a medium earthquake occurred. Even if I know that a collapse occurred, then, you know, that certainly tilts me more towards the strong earthquake. So now it's kind of half as likely that it was a strong earthquake as a medium earthquake, as opposed to the factor of 10 in the original probabilities. So I've kind of updated my probabilities using this information. But that, those prior probabilities of the, the medium and strong earthquake still play an important role here. And so that's, a, to me, a good example of a way in which probabilities can sometimes be non-intuitive, but with some very simple bookkeeping here uh, related to conditional probabilities, we can overcome our, our lack of intuition about these things and, and maintain a rigorous understanding of the effect of uncertainties on these types of outcomes. Okay, so that's total probability theorem and Bayes' rule.